Good morning. <clears throat> Welcome to the worship of the Lord on a beautiful Sunday morning. What a joy it is to be able to gather together, to be able to at least think in our minds, spring's on the way. And we are in the Lenten time of the year, a time leading up to Easter, a time when we celebrate new life, the life we have through the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's good to be able to worship him and to worship him together. We also want to welcome those who are worshiping from home via live streaming or through our recording of our service. We're glad that you also can be with us in that form. Would you please stand and join with me in our call to worship? It's a responsive call based on Psalm 122. It began with Israel... But now believers from all nations eagerly encourage one another as each new Lord's Day approaches. Let us go to the house of the Lord. On their way to the temple, God's people of old passed through the gates of Jerusalem. Introducing a new era, Jesus taught his disciples, I am the gate. No one comes to the Father except through me. When believers gather together around Christ, our temple cornerstone, he promises, I will be there also. God is with us today and forever. Receive God's greeting in the form of a blessing, grace, mercy, and peace be yours from God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God's people said, amen. Let's sing together to the Lord. Our song is, Lord, I, I lift your name on high. Psalm 15, Lord, who may dwell in your sanctuary? Who may live on your holy hill? He whose walk is blameless and who and has no slander on his tongue, who does his neighbor no wrong and casts no slur on his fellow man who despises a vile man, but honors those who fear the Lord, who keeps his oath even when it hurts, who lends his money without usury and does not accept a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things will never be shaken. We recognize in hearing those words that to be in the presence of a holy God requires that we be holy people, and of course, we are not. We are not blameless. Uh, we are not always honest. Sometimes we like to fudge the truth, even outright uh, break the truth. And so, as we come to worship, we come through Jesus Christ, through the cross, and what he has done to make us holy through his blood. We're going to sing together, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, which also has the refrain of the contemporary song, the wonderful cross. We'll be singing stanzas one 
and two, then the refrain, stanza three, the refrain, and then stanza four. Follow along with the screen, and you should have no problem. As we just sang, the love of Christ by which he redeems us leads to the truth that God rightly demands our life. He demands our love. He demands that we give him our all. Paul writes in Romans 12, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, this is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. 
then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another out of brotherly love. Honor one another above yourself. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with God's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. And do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is in the right of do what is right in the eyes of everybody. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. We give our lives, all that we are, as a living sacrifice to God. How we live each and every day is a spiritual act of worship, worship to the Lord. Let's go to God in prayer. Our Lord and our God, you are worthy of our lives, our love, all that we have and are. We thank you that by the power of your spirit, you take control of our hearts, our emotions, our attitudes, our lives. You continue to work within us to weed out sinful, inappropriate attitudes, hurtful words, thoughts, deeds that tear down and destroy life rather than build up and enhance life. We thank you, O oh Lord, that you work to help us to die to sin, to put that behind us, to live new lives as your people, Christians, people who are not just holding to a name or a label, but people who are walking with you through life, looking up to you with reverence, with holy fear, and yet with fear that is overcome by love, commitment, and devotion. Lord, your love for us inspires us. It's what motivates us, not only to be more kind and thoughtful and gracious and loving towards those that we live with, are married to, work with, or go to school with, but even more so, to give ourselves more wholly to you. Lord, work in our lives for your purposes. Help us to live with an eye to what you would have us to do and accomplish in life. Not simply to do our best to maintain moral purity, but to do our best to serve your kingdom goals, to promote what is right and true and just and loving. We pray that you would help us to have an eye to, in a heart that looks out and, and recognizes the needs of those around us so that we may share with one another, so that we may assist one another, bear each other's burdens, crying with each other, rejoicing with each other. We thank you, O oh Lord, that you have called us to yourself as a people, a body of Christ, and so we get to share in each other's lives in that way. And our lives are made the richer because of it. Lord, we come to you in Jesus' name and thank you for this opportunity to worship. We thank you for all the members of our congregation and for the fact that our, 
our congregation is part of a church that is so much bigger, bigger than us, bigger than our community, bigger than our nation. You are the God who deserves and receives praise and honor and glory from the tongues of people around the globe. We thank you that they too worship you. So come before you, Lord, we pray for our congregation. Today we lift up particularly uh, Roseman Clay, as well as Leo and, and Jean Ben Steinborn. We pray for, pray for Claire and Marilyn Ben Till. Lord, we pray for these members and all our members, that you would work your blessings in their lives, that you would protect them from harm and illness, that you would enrich them by your spirit and enable them to be a blessing also to others. We pray that you would be with uh, Rose in terms of her uh, eyesight and help her to manage uh, with the restrictions that her limited uh, eyesight also place on her. We pray for Claire with this long, long stretch of having these bone spurs on his jaw. We pray that these may uh, cease to appear and that he may have healing in that area. This morning, Lord, we also pray for Joe Jensey with his uh, disc, back disc problems with the bulging disc there. Lord, give healing to that. May it reduce down in size, we pray. We ask that you would also give safety to Ryan Knappen in his deployment and be with Mike and Mary as, out of, as they also deal with concern for his safety and, and provide care for, uh, assist in providing care for uh, their grandchildren too. Lord, we thank you that we can have a blood drive for uh, our community this week and pray that this too may be a way in which we serve you and, and provide loving help in a very specific way for those who need to have blood during times of illness. Oh Lord, as we come to you, we pray for our nation. We recognize that there are many needs in our land. Many are unemployed because of businesses that are closed down or have uh, shut down completely because of being unable to make ends meet. We pray for those, Lord, and we pray that you'd Help us to soon be free from this pandemic so that we and people around the world may be able to return to making a living, carrying out their lives in a more typical fashion. Lord, we pray for guidance for those who have that high position of authority in our country. We also pray for those who are teachers in our schools because we know that their work is, has been made so much more challenging because of the pandemic and, and the concerns that that places on the classroom and kids within it. Lord, lead us, guide us, give us wisdom, and where there are differences of perspective and opinion, help us to live in that harmony to which Paul called us in Romans chapter 12. And so, Lord, may our lives honor you, may we serve you, and may we, above all else, in all the ups and downs of life, May we lift up our hearts to the one who came down from heaven and was lifted up on the cross, who gave his life so that we may truly live. In his name we pray, amen. I'd like to invite the young children to come on up front for a children's message. Good morning. You look pretty this morning. Yeah. Do you like the sunshine out there today? I do too. I do. Makes me smile and be happy. You too? Yeah. Hi, Ethan. I took some signs or pictures of signs with me. What are these kids in this sign doing? They're what? Running. What else do they have there? A ball. One of the things that's dangerous for kids when they're playing, especially when they're playing with 
balls, is sometimes that ball will go out into the road. You shouldn't run after the ball, should you? Because you might get run over by a car. Deer, they don't know what you know. They don't know that warning, so they might run out into the road and, isn't that sad? They get, they get hit. Have you seen deer on the side of the road? Yeah. You know not to run out into the road, don't you? You know that you don't want to be like a deer that gets hurt. Yeah. So when we see these deer, it reminds us, it warns us not to do what the deer do, not to run out in the road, especially after a ball, right? There are other warning signs that we have, and I want to show you one here. This says, be careful, it's icy, it's icy, and you might just, what's happening to this person? <laughs> it's ice and he's, he's slipping, he's falling backwards, so caution, be careful, it's icy, you might fall. When kids get on a bus to go to school, and they get off the bus, some of them might go this way, some of them might go that way, and so people behind a bus have to be careful because they don't know where the kids will be going, and they need to stay behind that bus. This is a sign that might be by a lake, by a lake, river. It tells us three things not to do. No, no swimming there. Maybe the water is really going fast. And it's not safe to swim there. No fishing. Isn't that a bummer? No fishing. And no ice skating. When it's winter time, if that water is moving fast, the ice might not be very thick there. So it says, don't do that. We have these warnings, including this one, which says there's a bull in that field. Watch out, there's a bull, and bulls can be mean. So don't you go climbing the fence and into that field, or the bull might chase after you. These are warnings about bad things that can happen to us. The Bible also has warnings for us, warnings that are meant to help us. One of the warnings is, be sure that you trust God. God has made promises to us. God keeps his promises, so don't, don't lose your trust in his promises. Sometimes the people of God in the years back didn't trust him. They began to get afraid, and they even made these funny false gods and they bowed down before calves and bulls. Don't do that sort of thing, the Bible says. Trust God. He's the only true God. He'll take care of you. He's promised to send Jesus, and he's going to keep that promise. You know that if you come down, we also have something we promised to you, right? A tree. Pick your favorite color. Let's stand and in song celebrate that God has kept his promise to us. There is a redeemer. We have a redeemer. Christ the Lord. Spirit till my work on earth 
In 1 Corinthians 10, we find some helpful warnings that we receive through Paul, the Apostle Paul, uh, as he speaks to the church in Corinth, but also to us today. He points to Israel's past and some of the mistakes that Israel made in the past, which serve as warnings and challenges to us today. 1 Corinthians 10, I'll be reading verses 1 through 13. I might mention uh, that the context here, as it begins, the warnings are of Israel when they're out in the wilderness after their exodus out of Egypt. For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers, that our forefathers were all under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered over the desert. Now these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Do not be idolaters, as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to engage in pagan revelry. We shall not commit sexual immorality, as some of them did, and then one day 23,000 of them died. We should not test the Lord, as some of them did, and were killed by snakes. And do not grumble, as some of them did, and were killed by the destroying angel. These things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the fulfillment of the ages has come. So, if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man, and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. One of the major milestones on the road to adulthood is getting your driver's license. Most teens, not all, but most, look forward to getting their license. They get excited just thinking about it. Those who are honest will admit there's also a tinge of anxiety there. There's a lot of responsibility that comes with receiving the keys to the family's SUV. 
Driver's ed typically includes a classroom portion as well as some time behind the wheel. Frequently, classroom instructors make a practice of showing, somewhere throughout the class, showing gruesome pictures or a gruesome movie. The movie contains graphic pictures of actual highway accidents. This one caused by a drunk driver. Or maybe that one uh, by a driver who, who ran a red light. Thought he could make it, couldn't. This other one was due to slippery road conditions. So others are caused by sheer carelessness, uh, excessive speed, distracted driving. Now, it, it doesn't take a rocket scientist, of course, to figure out why driver's ed instructors choose to show these type of pictures and movies. They come right out. They tell their students, we don't want you. We don't want any of you to be that person carried off on a stretcher. And then comes the, the short but stern speech. When you get behind the wheel of a car that's carrying your brother or your sister or your friend, you are responsible not only for your own personal safety but for their safety. You're headed down the road 55, 65 miles per hour. Another car is coming at you, going the same speed. Combined, if you were to hit 130 mile per hour impact, keep your eyes on the road. Don't let yourself be distracted. Two, three feet is all that separates you and your passengers from life-altering injuries. Think wheelchairs or death. This is not a video game where you can crash your car and then start over with a brand new, perfectly good car 10 seconds later. It is extremely important that you take this responsibility that's being given to you very seriously. Well, the Apostle Paul gives a similar speech with respect to the faith journey that we are on. We're traveling with God to a future in which Life is going to be absolutely, completely, totally good. Christ will be king. God will be central to all that we and everyone else does. Every last smear caused by sin will have been wiped clean. Every stab of pain caused by evil will have been healed. To the new Christians in, in the church in Corinth, <clears throat> Christians who have just begun traveling down the road to this future, Paul issues a stern warning. <clears throat> Stay alert. Keep your eyes on the road ahead. If you are to enter into the future that God has in store for you, a wonderful future, it's extremely important that you treat your life's journey of faith in God seriously. Keep an eye out for destructive potholes. Bitterness, resentment, anger, for example. And remember, sin still has a strong pull over you. Don't let alluring billboards lead you down an exit ramp. Stay on the straight and narrow. Don't let yourself be distracted. In, in hearing this type of stern warning from Paul, you might be a bit perplexed. Why the sternness? Why the alarmist type of tone? Isn't salvation God's gracious gift to us? If we mess up, isn't he forever ready and eager, even willing, to forgive us? God is loving. God is compassionate, isn't he? Well, he most certainly is. Precisely because he loves us, though, He's unyielding in his opposition to any and all sinful behavior. Our Heavenly Father knows the damage that sin does. He's keenly aware of how deadly it is, especially in terms of our relationship with him. Whenever we sin, we put distance between ourselves and God. The more we come to like a particular sin, the more unlike God we become, because God detests sin. 
Now, Satan has managed to get most people to take a rather light view with respect to sin. It's not really that big a deal, they say. Sometimes they roll their eyes, even at our, at our concerns. <laughs> they laugh and say, what are you afraid of? Are you afraid that God's going to zap you with a lightning bolt right where you stand? Sometimes even we who identify ourselves as Christ's followers adopt far too light an approach to sin. We do something that we know we shouldn't, but we go ahead and do it, kind of thinking to ourselves, I'll repent later on. I'm sure God will forgive me. There's a problem with that. God knows what's in a person's heart. Repentance is more than words that you speak. It's more than feelings that you conveniently allow to emerge only after the fact. Genuine repentance involves a sincere, all-out determination to flee from sin, to leave it, and follow Jesus. Sin's power to tempt and entrap continues to pose a genuine danger to every one of us, even the most dedicated among us. And that is never so serious as when we relax or develop a half-hearted, carefree approach to our journey with God. In 1 Corinthians 10, Paul warns about the dangers that sin continues to present even to the Christian. These are avoidable. By God's help, with God's help, they are survivable. And yet they're nothing for us to treat lightly. Do these dangers really pose much of a threat for us who believe in Jesus, who receive forgiveness through the cross? Well, Paul's uh, warnings come out of the experience of Old Testament Israel, precisely because they do. We are those on whom the fulfillment of the ages has come. And so we wonder, is it really a threat to us? All that God has been doing for his people in previous ages, we've seen come to fruition in Jesus Christ. We are those who have witnessed, through the Bible, we've witnessed the lame to walk, the blind come to see. We've seen Jesus bring the dead back to life. We've witnessed Jesus successfully repel Satan's temptations. And hopefully we've learned a thing or two from him about how to, use, how to use Scripture, God's Word, as our sword to fight off temptation. We know that Jesus Christ has a power that is superior to that of the forces of evil. Because we know how Jesus spoke to the demons that possessed one man in whom they had lived since he was born. He ordered them out, and they left with a shriek. The king of glory has come. He's Emmanuel. He's the promised of ages. We've seen Jesus bring to fulfillment the promise that God made to Eve back there at the very beginning when our parents first, first parents fell into sin. With Jesus' death, with his resurrection, we know that a new era has dawned. We're up. We're on the way. The life of slavery is behind us. The kingdom of God is before us. And all the signs we've seen tell us that we've taken the right path in deciding to follow Jesus. And this, surprisingly, is precisely why we have good reason to beware, to be on our guard. It's when you're humming right along at a good speed, eager to arrive at your destination, confident of the road that you're taking, it's then that you're most likely to overlook and disregard the warning signs of danger. Who would have expected that patch of ice when you've been driving along, and the road has been clear and dry for miles. You've been cruising right along. There's very little traffic. You're relaxed, enjoying the scenery. Suddenly a deer leaps out in front of you. You hit the deer before you can hit your brakes. To motivate us to stay alert behind the wheel as we travel the road to glory, Paul shares several rather sobering stories from Israel's past. 
Before he does that, he says a few things that sound rather strange to our ears and you may like to have explained a bit. He says, I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact that our forefathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and the sea. The point that Paul is making here is, don't think this can't happen to you. God was present there in the wilderness with our forefathers also. God led them during the day with a, a white cloud sailing ahead of them in the sky. All those whom God delivered from slavery had passed through the sea, the Red Sea. It was a mass baptism, Paul says. In one mad dash through the waters of the Red Sea, they were marked as God's people. They were on their way. They were walking by faith, amazed at the very thought that they were a free people. At the time, the future before them existed purely in the form of a promise. But it was a promise that was unforgettably sealed on the mountaintop by God himself. They trekked into the wilderness with confidence. They knew firsthand the saving power of their God. Paul points out that those who marched out of Egypt as a freed nation had all of this going for them. And yet, nevertheless, only a few of them ever reached their destination. Why? Why? Paul soberly reports, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered over the desert. No doubt while traveling along a busy highway, you've seen those white crosses and bouquets of artificial flowers that have been placed by family members uh, to the side of the highway at a spot where a person they dearly loved died in a car accident. These memorials do more than honor the dead. They serve as warnings for the rest of us as we're driving down that roadway. People have died. They've died right here at this spot. Travel with care. Paul, a Jew, points back to the history of his people. And he writes, these things occurred as examples to us to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. These were written down as warnings for us on whom the fulfillment of the ages has come. If you think you're standing firm, be careful. Be careful that you don't fall. Paul doesn't just plant a few white crosses. He lights red road flares as warnings to mark the danger spots for those who come along later. What had happened? In each case, what drew God's people off the shoulder of the road and sent them plunging to their deaths was a failure of faith in God. I'll touch only briefly on the, the background of the examples that Paul provides, but think of them as flares, road flares, or perhaps as rumble strips. They warn of a dangerous situation that's just ahead. Their purpose is to grab your attention, to get you thinking, to ask yourself, what similar dangers do, do I face, do we face? today. Paul's first example of the severe consequences of sin occurs already as Israel is encamped at the base of Mount Sinai. In that dry and isolated place, the people already lose faith in God. Why the sudden change in attitude? Their deliverer, their godly leader is absent. And he's been gone for days. Moses had, had ascended up to the top of the mountain in order to meet with God, to receive from God the covenant law, what amounts to being the constitution that would govern life in this new nation. It's been taking Moses a long time, much longer than they expected. The people waiting down below get nervous. They didn't think he'd be gone quite so long. Has something happened to Moses? Were they mistaken to listen to him, to leave the relative security of Egypt behind and chase after him into the wilderness? Or were they foolish to believe the promises 
of a God whom they could not see. They grow impatient and anxious, even panicky. And as that time stretches on, their faith in the Lord begins to slip. As hard as it is to fathom, they begin to question the reality and the power of the God who brought them out of Egypt. When they can stand it no longer, when they can no longer bear being out there all alone, they make a golden calf and they worship it. They do not break camp, spiritually speaking, and yet they return to Egypt. They return to Egypt's gods. There can be no question that this golden God is present with them. The strength, the attractiveness of this God is obvious for them all to see. Perhaps you can see the lines of connection to our day. It's been almost 2,000 years since Christ our God sent deliverer, died on the cross, was raised from the grave, and ascended into heaven. As was the case with Moses, Jesus seems to be taking an unbearably long time about returning. The future promised to us seems terribly distant. Meanwhile, all around us are numerous gods of gold. What they offer us falls short of the biblical paradise, God has laid out before us. But the attraction that they present is undeniable. Pheasant hunters have a saying, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. In other words, you're better to take what you can readily get than holding off for something bigger, something better, and winding up going home empty-handed. Some of you deer hunters know what that's all about. There's nothing quite like the security that's offered by a God that's right there in front of you, one that you can see glimmering in the sunshine with all of its physical beauty and attractiveness. Out of impatience and fear, including the fear that we might miss out on that which is present here and now, that which is ours for the taking, we face the temptation to give up on Christ's return. We feel a nervous pressure to embrace the admittedly limited and yet visibly attractive sources of security and guidance <clears throat> and enjoyment that this present world has to offer to us. Why pass these up when it's looking like you just might not get that future that you were hoping for? We're tempted to sit down at the table that the world sets before us and drink deeply from that cup of material prosperity. We're tempted to get a bit tipsy even on political power in the pursuit of it or to chase after accomplishments that are just of limited value. We're tempted to place our greatest faith, our ultimate hope for good, pleasant, and flourishing life and the golden gods of our day, not what lies beyond this life. You know what tugs at your heart. What are your highest priorities in life? What are your most pressing pursuits? Who are you? What constitutes your core identity? What matters most to you? What relationships have priority over all others? To whom? Do you belong? What is your source of comfort throughout life and as you approach death? Do not let go of your faith in Christ's return and in his coming reign. Don't stop longing for a future in which God will mean everything and sin nothing. It'll be no more. In fact, begin to make that future reality a present reality in your own life. It's crystal clear that we're not there yet. We're not at that future God has promised to us yet. Forbidden fruit 
continues to hold strong appeal to us as sons and daughters of Adam and Eve. Paul sets out a second fiery red flare in order to warn his readers of a deadly road hazard which took the lives of some 20,000 people in Israel. Sexual immorality engaged in as part of the worship of Baal of Peor. It was a degree of religious and moral unfaithfulness that God could not stomach. It was a serious matter. The punishment was immediate. Today, multitudes of Americans have been duped into thinking that engaging in sex outside of marriage is no big deal. No big deal, just so long as both parties give their consent. They don't see the harm being done to society, the pain being caused individuals, the negative impact it can have on, on children. Because of this irreverent disregard, for the will of God. In our individualized culture, the focus has turned to self-centered emotional and physical pleasure, often obtained through a series of short-term and intimate relationships. God's far superior intention has been and remains far superior. His intention is to bond a man and a woman in a life-uniting, life-enriching, life-encompassing relationship of self-giving love. The ideal environment also for nurturing and equipping the next generation. Our culture has become such a highly sexualized culture. And coupled with that, it's impossible to miss the sexual confusion that has become present. The combination of the two has produced some very, very bizarre results. It's become accepted doctrine in our land. Yes, doctrine. It's a religious type of passion and belief. It's become accepted doctrine that one's sexual appetite simply must be fed. Whether you're single or married, straight or gay, young or old, why must it? At what cost? At the cost of your very life? At the cost of the emotional health and security of our nation's children? At the cost of arousing the Lord's anger and disgust? Are we to treasure this more than the joy that comes when we faithfully, devotedly serve our Lord? To worship at the altar of sexual lust is an act of disloyalty and irreverence to the Lord our God. It is poisonous to our relationship to him. Paul's third travel advisory is a strong warning against the deadliness of driving south in a northbound traffic lane. God appointed Moses to deliver his people from Egypt and to take them to the promised land. Moses acted with divine authority in his role as the nation's deliverer, but also as their travel guide along the way. Paul cites two occasions when the people grumbled, not only against the Lord, but against Moses. They grumbled against Moses and by extension the Lord. One time this involved three men, Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, Another time, it involved the entire nation. In both cases, those involved rebelled against Moses and complained that he had not led them. He was not leading them to the promised land. In fact, they falsely charged he had led them out of a land flowing with milk and honey, and he was leading them to their deaths in a cemetery, the desert. God responded to Israel's lack of faith. He responded to their open defiance by sending a plague, a plague of deadly snakes, which made their false claims come true. Moses pleaded with the Lord to show mercy on his people. The Lord listened to Moses' prayer of intercession. 
and graciously provided a way out. When the people looked up to a bronze serpent, bronze snake that Moses had lifted up and placed high on a pole, when they looked to that and believed God's promise of healing, God's death sentence was also lifted from them. What's the state of your confidence in God and in the future he has promised to you? Are you holding firm to your, your dedication and devotion to the Lord? Do you cry out to him, come Lord, come quickly, bring an end to the misery of grief and depression, of loneliness and rejection, of infidelity and dishonesty, of greed and, and spiritual deadness? We're tempted to find our security in attractive gods of gold, gods that are visibly present here among us. We're tempted to pursue short-lived physical pleasure rather than finding joy in a life that's finding its joy in pleasing the Lord. We're tempted to let go of faith in God's promised future, to grumble over the Lord's directives for our lives and to head back to Egypt, where we came from. But we do not need to give way to such temptations. God has provided us a way out, a way out of temptation, a way out of sin. He has provided us a way to conquer unbelief, to overcome our rebellious inclination to go our own way, rather than listen to his word as our authoritative guide for life. Hear the good news. Believe the good news. In Christ, the fulfillment of age-old promises has begun. There's only one thing that remains unknown. Will you hold firmly to your faith in the Lord? Will you trust him? Find joy in him? Follow him and receive his word as your authoritative guide for your life. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we are grateful to you that we need not find our own way through the wilderness. We need not depend on our own strength, for we would panic. We would become very anxious. We would be fearful just like Israel of old. We thank you that you are with us, that you are present by your spirit, that you are instructing us and leading us, assuring us, guiding us, taking away our fears through your holy word. Give us ears to hear and feet that are obedient. Give us hearts that love you, Lord, and help us to show reverence to you, to worship you, not, in, not simply in a building, but in our lives, in all that we do. In Jesus' name. Although Jesus Christ is the holy, holy Son of God, he's our friend. He's that great, and he's that close. What a friend we have in Jesus.
trials and temptations. Is there trouble anywhere? Wish would never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrows share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Are we weak and heavy laden, cumbered with a load of care? Precious Savior, still our refuge. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Do your friends despise, forsake you? Take it to the Lord in prayer. In his arms he'll take and shield you. You will find a solace there. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. To God be the glory, to God be the glory, to God be the glory for the things he has done. With his blood he has saved me, with his power he has raised me to God.